Hello, welcome to the Hoop Collective Podcast presented by State Farm. Got a couple of guys today joining me from Indianapolis, an all-star weekend. First up, our guy who's looking forward to leaving Indianapolis. I mean, just kidding. Thrilled with all-star weekend, Tim Bontemps. I'm just thrilled that for a second straight pod, I can talk to somebody who I don't have to teach any vocab words to. It's great. Oh, wow. Wow. And wow. that is our man, George Sedano, who is doing sidelines in uh, for their ESPN radio at Sunday night's all-star game um, and enjoying uh, enjoying all the festivities in Indianapolis as well. What's up, George? What's up, guys? Freezing my face outside uh, <laughs> in the arena, but other than that, I'm okay. Yeah, Mr. Miami and Mr. L.A., not the best weekend for him where the temperature the last couple of days has averaged about 17 degrees uh, yeah. without wind chill. I just want you to guys know in this chaotic world um, that we are in February and everybody involved with the NBA is unhappy on (laughs) All-Star Weekend and can't wait to get out. Everything is just fine. (laughs) Don't worry about it. Everything's going to be just fine. We're doing great. No, Uh, can we seriously just do what the Super Bowl does most years, which is just like warm weather cities? Or at the very least, let's alternate. Because... Because the NBA rewards cities who give public financing for arenas <laughs> with the All Star Game, and that is a ding, different ding, pod- ding, ding. that is a different podcast for a different time. That is, <laughs> it is not as exciting to talk about as what we are going to talk about right off the bat here, which is the Golden State Warriors. I think I kind of got missed a little bit last week because the first half of the season was ending and people were getting away, um, but the Warriors had a fascinating final two days before the all-star break with a win and a loss. Um, And the loss was to the Clippers and George, you were doing sidelines for ESPN in that game. And the Clippers made a a comeback on the Warriors, um, a game that I thought was over when Ty Lue got ejected with nine minutes left. You were sitting courtside and you got to see two amazing coaches reactions from close up one Ty Lue getting ejected, the rare, Kylo ejection, but more amazingly, before we go on to what's going on with the Warriors, uh, Steve Kerr's meltdown. Is it fair to say meltdown when yeah. Clay yes. Thompson <laughs> yes. uh, inexplicably fouled in the final, what was there? 40 some odd seconds, I believe. Yeah. Fouled, yeah it was like 37 fouled. seconds, I think. Yeah. Intentionally fouled in the backcourt while Steve was 12 feet away saying nobody foul. Um, George, he might have been closer than that, to be honest. Okay, with you. George, take us, take us through that experience that you got to witness close up before we talk about the Warriors. So this was a very physical game uh, down the stretch, hence why Ty was getting upset. Uh, Mason Plumley and guys, other guys on the Warriors, uh, it wasn't one particular guy. They were all kind of going at it, like against Mason Plumley. So Plumley is battling for. I mean, Plumley did go to Duke. That's all I'm going to say. That's true. Uh, him and Pajemski are battling for a rebound, and Pajemski goes down, um, but Plumlee gets hit in the face while Pajemski then claims to get hit in the face. I, I think they both did get hit in the face in their struggle for the ball, um, but Ty belie- was upset because he feels like Mason was being targeted because he was the bigger player, basically. Um, and it-, it was just kind of the culmination of what had transpired throughout the entire game where Ty felt like they weren't getting any whistles and he was just on James Williams, the referee, the entire game. So that's it. He had had it. He was going to go off. He was just going to keep yelling at them until eventually he got tossed. I believe it might have been his first ejection. Uh, Someone on the staff was researching it, couldn't find a previous ejection for him. So he's going off. He, you know, he he gets his money's worth, let's just say, because it took him a while to get off the floor. So then the Clippers who were down double digits, I believe at the time, come back this furious rally without Ty Lue. It was very much like a baseball manager from the eighties. It felt like Earl Weaver or Tommy Lasorda or Billy Martin getting tossed and their team coming back. So, none of our listeners know who those guys are, George, not one of them. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, so just Google it kids. Um, so, so anyway, they, uh, they make this furious comeback. They take the lead, right. And they end up with like a five point lead. Warriors come back, they close within three on that particular possession, right? So to your point, they're on the Warriors side of of the court. 
So Steve can can yell to them and they all should be able to hear. And it was an obvious situation, which Steve said after the fact in the post game that you don't foul in that spot. You're down three. There's 30, 40 seconds left. You've got time to play defense. So Clay inexcusably makes this horrendous play where he fouls the inbounder, which was Russell Westbrook right away. And Steve just so the viewers can see this on TV throws his head back with his hands, you know, buried it, his head buried <laughs> in his hands and just like goes down to like his knees and like screaming, like what, like why? No. And he's going nuts. Chris Paul, by the way, also kind of throws up his hands right next to Steve. Oh my gosh. Like, Brandon Pajemski, the rookie yeah. was like horrified at the veteran future hall of famer, Clay Thompson's, uh, you know, frankly bonehead mental mistake. Steve's right. reaction was like out of some movie, like where, it, you know, there's like the dramatic scene where, you know, somebody dies or something crazy happens and people start yes. yelling. It was, yes. it was an unbelievable reaction. It moment. really was like <laughs> as wild a thing as you'll ever see a reaction from a coach in real time and everyone for that matter. Right. Like all the players involved. Steph was trying to console him a little bit and Clay just kind of walked past him. Uh, Steph, the only person trying to console him. I mean, Steve Kerr, as Russell Westbrook is shooting the free throws, is walking up and down the sideline, just muttered, muttering to himself, <laughs> I can't bleep and believe this. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he was that bad. Um, like he was muttering to himself, I can't believe this. And eventually, I mean, the Warriors had won seven out of eight games. They're on they were a, on a roll. Yeah. Right, yes. Yeah, so anyway, long story short, it, it was horrendous. And Steve did not take up for him at all. Um, it, oh, he and, didn't take but, up for him. He he took, he didn't take up for him so much for stardom the next day, which is what we're yeah. going to talk about in a minute, but I just wanted right. to get the full scene. There. Yeah. So that, that was it. It was, but again, I, I don't even think I can encapsulate how insane the whole thing was because of the way he reacted. Like if you can go back and watch it on YouTube, that's, that was only like, honestly, like Georgie, half. we have the rights. This is a television show on ESPN. Go to watch yeah. ESPN, baby. Yeah. Watch ESPN. There you go. But anyway, so you can watch the reaction and you can watch it over and over again, but it still wasn't even the full picture because of just all the stuff, the way guys were reacting from different parts of the floor, including his coach, who again was muttering the whole time. I can't believe it. Like as he was walking up and down pace. Well, I will say Wednesday night was a really big night for uh, action in the tunnels at NBA arenas because after the game, which was a huge win, obviously for the Clippers, and this has got to be a first bond temps. Ty Lu gets caught on video coming out of the Clipper locker room talking smack about the officiating because he got ejected and then the team came back and won. And really the no-no, he called out James Williams by name. Yeah. Like he was sort of fake yelling, hey, James, hey, James. Um, and by and the way, in the face. I didn't see this. Was it as these guys were walking by? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was waiting for them in the tunnel. Oh. Yeah, and which he got. That's why he got fined. That's oh, why he got fined. Kick, kick him in the okay. face. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I didn't. I didn't see any of that. That's yeah, amazing. So, so Ty got fined by the league, not for getting ejected. He got fined for screaming outside the locker room. That just happened to get caught on camera oh, on social media. It wasn't at the podium, okay. right, George? It was no. just he was outside the locker camera. room area. Yeah, because you know the the visiting locker room. Um, as you guys know, but for the audience, when you're going through the tunnel, um, which is on the which is on the warrior side, but across, that's where the visiting locker room is. Right. Um, right. So it, you walk through that tunnel and maybe another 30, 40 feet, um, 50 feet. There's the, the visiting locker room is right there. Yeah. So anyway, Ty gets fined for that tunnel. Then we have the little tunnel action over in Phoenix where uh, Isaiah Stewart slugged. Yeah. <laughs> slugged um, Drew Eubanks from the Suns. And I will just say uh, the video has not come out yet. Um, there is video. I talked to somebody who saw it and that someone told me it doesn't look good for beef stew. <laughs> it, you know, but the Pistons point of view is that Isaiah Stewart was provoked, but the video probably it's probably, you know, surveillance video. You probably doesn't have audio. So, um, but the NBA hasn't ruled on that yet. My guess is that it's not going to be good. But that was that was the action in the tunnels uh, on the uh, on the penultimate night of the first uh, before the All Star break. So tunnel week. We're still dealing with the legislation of that. Um, 
But the Warriors are what's more fascinating here. So they they have this really terrible loss uh, while they're playing great. You know, they're playing so well. Draymond is starting to run his mouth again, starting to act crazy on the court. We didn't even talk about that. I mean, you know, you can find Ty Lu for that, but if there's someone should have been fined, then some of the stuff that Draymond was doing on the court was a I little was stunned. Bit... I was wow. stunned he wasn't fined. Stunned. Um yeah, uh, that was another thing where you couldn't hear it, and it's a good thing, but obviously there's been some lip reading that's been done, and uh, you can find it if you want. But Draymond's antics on the court were, you know, I, I, look, I know he's gone after Yusef Nurkic about 15 different ways, and it's fine, and he had a long podcast uh, really attacking Nurkic, and I'll just say I'm impressed that Draymond Green's able to do a podcast without any help and just talk to the camera. That takes, you got to have some content, and he he did. Um, but what Yusef Nurkic said is that he didn't learn anything and that it's only a matter of time before something again happens. And, you know, what do you want, what do you want me to say? You know, I, I can't disprove the Nurkic's uh, pr- my point of view there. He is playing great, though, and the Warriors are playing great. So they suffer that loss, and then they have a really tough back-to-back in Utah, as much as it can be in, in tough because I think the Jazz were kind of not thrilled about having to play this game. It's the makeup game that unfortunately uh, the game was postponed when the Warriors had that tragedy with their assistant coach Decky happened last month. Um, or was it, I don't know if it might've been in February. I don't, whatever it was, it was a terrible moment. And this is when the makeup game was, which was the last day before the all-star uh, break. And so uh, the jazz had played the night before um, against the Lakers. I'm not sure where they were, but still, the Warriors go there, and Steve Kerr makes a major, major move, and he sends Clay Thompson to the bench. And this is one of the most fascinating things that's happened in the NBA season. Again, there were only three games on the calendar. It was the last day. It was totally getaway. Um, the game was not on national television. Yeah, it was even um, overshadowed by Milwaukee losing to Memphis in Memphis. Going right, which, which was arguably the worst loss in the NBA this season because – Memphis started two guys on 10 day contracts, including one guy who had been on the 10 day contract for about 33 hours. Um, it's, I mean, obviously any 10 day starter is not a good sign, but if the guys had a few practices in a couple games, but, um, uh, Brandon Goodwin basically got in from the airport, started in a game and it beat the bucks. But so Steve Kerr decides to make the move on temps where, he brings he brings um play to the bench. And, and the reason he did this was because Brandon Pajemski has been playing so really well. And the lineup that he's been putting out there with Pajemski and, and Kuminga, basically the, the 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 two timeline lineup, you might as well call it, even though that Pajemski wasn't part of the two timeline declaration. But this is something that they've sort of gone to as this they've been trying to plug holes and figure out the season, but that lineup, which is Steph Curry and, and Pajemski as the guards, um, uh, Andrew Wiggins and Kuminga as the forwards and Draymond as the center, that lineup has been extremely effective in the small sample size. Stats Williams says they're um, plus 26 net efficiency. So outscored the opposition by, 26 points per 100 possessions in about 107 minutes of playing together. 107 minutes, obviously a small sample size, but it's not nothing. Steve Kerr leans into that bond temps, starts Pajemski. The Warriors play great against the Jazz. Clay has 35 off the bench. And now we have the Warriors playing hot with a new lineup and with Clay Thompson saying he's okay with it. Yeah, I mean, look, we talked a couple weeks ago when I was in Brooklyn for the the sort of the beginning of this when Clay Thompson, after being benched a couple different times, was benched in the fourth quarter um, in a close game in Brooklyn when Golden State really desperately needed a win uh, for Guy Santos, who was a late second round pick who had only played, I think, 61 minutes in the league going into that game, playing over him in the closing minutes of the game. And everybody afterward, including Steve, led by Steve Kerr, just sort of saying, yeah, like, you know, this is just the way it is at the moment. Um, and, you know, like the lineup with that lineup with Clay Thompson in there instead of Pajemski is plus 11 for 100 possessions in about 130 minutes, which really the key to that has been they, they have 
Draymond Green out there without Kevon Looney, they've looked much better this season and a big part of yeah, the last 10 and... games, which is basically since Draymond kind of got back and going they're there's their eighth in defense. They were in the, they were like 23rd when he came back from the suspension. Yeah. I mean the, the lineup with Looney and Draymond had been so good coming into this season. And that was an abject disaster this year. And Looney's been really bad. And that that's been a big part of their struggles overall. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, this clay story has been an ongoing subplot for weeks now. And as you've correctly pointed out, he's still a good player who's having a good year. Like it, it's obviously his lowest shooting year um, from three, but he's still in the mid to high thirties from three on very high volume. And is still a really useful player who can help a lot. But like we've talked about a bunch, his dealing with age and getting into his mid thirties and sort of moving into this next phase of his career is emblematic of the situation the entire team is in. And, you know, Pajemski has been fantastic this year and has stepped right in and been uh, a tremendous fit playing next to Steph. He gives them another ball handler in the backcourt and, you know, the juxtaposition of clay making that foul on Wednesday Curve finally pulling the plug on sending him to the bench, which it seemed like something they were sort of dancing around the idea of doing for a while the next day. And then Clay having 35 off the bench and helping them win a three point game in Utah going into the break, which they needed and, you know, gives them some optimism going into it. Like it's just a pretty remarkable twist um, in what's been a, a very wild season and that's even in the wake of the the story that Adrian Ramona had with all the stuff with LeBron you know the Warriors reaching out to the Lakers trying to trade for well, LeBron where certainly yeah there were two ways you could do that trade one would be right. Chris Paul and other people yeah. one would yeah. be Clay Thompson and other people so it it's just a lot the Warriors never lack for drama and the, the, those days yeah, before George. the break was the latest example of it yeah George I obviously the Warriors never actually made a formal offer for LeBron because um, it never got there. But when they made the call, they had to know what their offer was probably going to be. And Clay is not a fool. Um, so he had to know that that offer, they were basically considering trading him, even if that wasn't the way it was even going to go. And even if Joe Lacob could get on the witness stand and say, I solemnly swear I never offered Clay Thompson for LeBron James. You don't, you don't have to be a fool. Um, but I don't know if you got a sense when you were there and around the Warriors the other day that you thought this might be coming with Clay going to the bench. Well, I will say this. He was more withdrawn, it felt like, as I think back to that game. And again, his routine is normally kind of to himself, right? He shoots, he sits on the bench. But it, it just felt like he was less engaged. And now that foul, right, that we're all discussing or that we discussed earlier, maybe makes a little more sense because maybe his head was who knows where uh, in that scenario. I mean, this is me just extrapolating now. Stuff no, I think that, well, I mean, I'm not I don't I don't think what you're saying is that you think he had the mental mistake because of the LeBron thing. I think in general, Clay has been off. In a fog, the whole season, the right. entire much of the season, right. and, and, and this didn't help. Is my this point. is just an example of it, and um, yeah, I. And here's what I would add, Brian. Um, when you know Richard Jefferson and I and, and Dave Pash were doing that game, and we were talking to people amongst the Warriors, like we were talking about Clay. Like on the record, I asked Steve Kerr, which I reported in the game, was like about kind of the rawness of what he's dealing with and the emotional roller coaster. You know, Bontemps referenced the Brooklyn game, right? That was the game. Yeah, he's having interviews. He's going through this in front of cameras. Right. And, you know, I asked Steve, I said, how many conversations have you had with Clay this season about kind of the challenges that he's been going through? And he said, easily half a dozen. Right. So this has been a constant thing that they have tried to manage. And remember, this was a guy who at one point when they asked him, you know, is clay low maintenance, high maintenance. He famously said he's no maintenance. Remember back right. then. Yeah. And you know what? So Richard and 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 I and Dave were asking people around the Warriors, like we just as we were having conversations walking around the arena, like we asked them, and and to Richard's credit, he brought it up. He's like, What about like Clay morphing into kind of Ray Allen Miami? And for people that don't remember Ray Allen Miami, Brian, you and I were there. 
Um, you know, he comes in from Boston and he has that sixth man role, basically playing 26 minutes a night. You know, he shot, I think, 42 percent from three the year they won the championship. And then he shot, I think, 38 percent the second year when they went to the finals. But that role might be more suitable for him at this stage. Now, Ray was 37 when he did that. You know, Clay is 34, but Ray was not coming off the injuries that Clay had. And I think there was a little bit, I don't want to call it fool's gold because that's disrespectful, but like it, it felt like Clay maybe had come, uh, had, had gotten over a hump last year. Cause remember, he had an incredibly slow start Absolutely. last year. Absolutely. And a great second half. Great right. second half. January last year, last season, he scored 27.3 points per game, I believe, which is the highest scoring average of his career in a month. And then in February, had the third highest scoring average in his career. So I guess people felt like, wow, Clay really bounced back from those, those injuries that he had. But, you know, he struggled a little bit during the playoffs. And in that Lakers series, for all the histrionics we saw with Kerr in that last game we referenced, I'll tell you what, in those games in LA, particularly the last game they played, Clay was taking some ill-advised shots and Kerr was doing some of that stuff back then. You could go mm-hmm. back and watch those games, particularly mm-hmm. at the end. And there was some of that there. And the body language of the team and, and their coach at that time when Clay was taking shots was not great either. So maybe this is ha- maybe this is the new role for Clay. Maybe this is what he needs to allow himself to be more effective for this particular team. Well, well Steve Kerr is really back- yeah, There's one other backdrop to this, too, with this whole Clay thing, which is what we've talked about before, which is that he is going to be an unrestricted free agent this summer. Well, and I wanted to read something that Joe Lacob, the very outspoken owner of the Warriors, said on a podcast with Tim Kawakami, longtime columnist in the Bay, who is at The Athletic. This is just the beginning of a very long quote about the offseason, but I think it's relevant. Our plan one, or 1A actually, is we'd like to be out of the tax, and we think we have a way to do that. That kind, that kind of is the plan, not just under the second apron. By the way, the tax for next season, per Bobby Marks' projections, $171 million. The Warriors currently have seven players under contract. They're at $137 million. So that's $34 million to fill out the roster. And that is a roster that, as of now, does not have either Chris Paul or Clay Thompson on it for next season. So... That is the other subplot to this whole That's thing. the other part of the Ray Allen thing, George. Yes, he took a smaller role coming off the bench. He also signed for the the mid-level. quote unquote mini mid level, which was about three and a half million back then. And he signed and he, with a different team. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, the Celtics famously offered more and were shell shocked when he went to not only another team, but to the team that was their big rival in the The East. the other team. Right. Um I will also point out that Clay was part of the fourth quarter where the Warriors almost blew an 18 point lead against the Jazz as they continue to have, I think they're contractually obligated to play clutch games. They've played 36 games that have come down to the final five minutes. Um, and they are um, actually 37, and they are 18 and 19 in those games. So, um, the clay off the bench thing is uh, to be monitored and to be continued. Also, I think Steve Kerr has really rolled up his sleeves and um, been co- doing a lot of kick coaching this year, looking at all these changes he's made and um, all those conversations with clay. And I'm sure a lot of stuff they've also gone through just uh, emotionally as well. Moment presented by state farm and look, I can't imagine, I have an idea of what the magic moment of this weekend is, but I'm going to yield to the two guys who are in, uh, in Indianapolis at all-star weekend. Bon temps. What's your magic moment that you've experienced this weekend? I mean, to me, it was pretty obviously Steph and Sabrina last night. Um, which I frankly thought should have been the final event of the night. I mean, George is doing sidelines for radio, so I'll be curious what his thoughts were for it, but um, you know, we all know that the dunk contest does not have the same allure that it used to. I, I think shout Why out do to you Jay say Lin- that? Because two of the four guys who were in it were in the G League, basically. Yeah. Well, and listen, I think Jalen Brown deserves a lot of credit for yeah, agree. doing the dunk contest, like being willing to do it. I thought the the white glove Michael Jackson dunk with his left hand was uh um was pretty was pretty great. 
on a lot and of I'm levels. I'm sure that no one is ever going to bring up that move when he has a bad turnover with his left hand in the playoffs here. I'm sure it will not backfire well, at all. Well, but I but that to me was him sort of poking fun at, that. at yeah. acknowledging all like I thought that was a very cool thing for yeah. him to do. Now, yeah. you know, his dunks got panned and he ended up losing to Matt McClung in the finals, which I do wonder like I actually think that's got a chance to keep any stars from doing this thing going forward um i'll be interested to see how that goes but well, in i think my, in my humble opinion for that. this is a magic moment but in my humble opinion um nothing has the nate robinson era and no offense to nate robinson yeah the nate robinson era had the nba has never recovered from that where he like won the aaron contest. gordon vince carter one in toronto which was i know and it was truly botched. spectacular and it was botched the, wow. the scoring was botched. The scoring wow. was botched. Aaron Gordon got robbed. Listen yeah. to you. All right. And well, you anyway, said, you said Vince Carter. Well, well, Zach Levine, right? Yeah. 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 Well, anyway, uh, but he, the, the way, Jalen Brown did George. screw that dunk up though, because he meant to do the D Brown thing where he covered his head and he didn't do it until well, that was the one when he did the, he tried to, <laughs> that was when he did the, he jumped over Kai Sinat and, and caught the lot from J, Jason Tatum, which by the way, Jason Tatum comes out there to do this lob. He's got on this enormous jacket, just yeah. gigantic. I can't how even much, imagine what's how What's the much retail it value of that I, jacket? So much money. I don't even want to know. So much. My car. Probably my car. <laughs> uh, way more than that. Way more than that, I bet. Uh, and he doesn't take it off. No. I was like. Well, if you paid that much jacket? for that jacket, I wouldn't take it off in front of well, national television. Well, but I, I mean, he's, he was like, I don't know. It was crazy. Anyway, we got off topic. The, that all was after. You know, who would have worn, you know who was from a St. Louis guy who would have worn that uh, that uh, coat out there, Bontemps? Who's that? Bob Pettit? Bob Pettit. <laughs> it's true. We got nice. our Bob Pettit reference in. There we go. Um, but yeah, like the, that was all after the Stefan Sabrina thing, which going into the All-Star weekend, that was probably the single. I mean, there were two things everybody, to, at least that I heard, was talking about. One was, is the game going to be any good? which as of right now, we don't know. We'll see what happens. The other was the Steph and Sabrina thing and how it was going to go and who was going to win. And, you know, there was a lot of buzz in the arena. Now, it was in Lucas Oil Arena. They had the LED court. And, I like, I don't know what you thought, George, but it was so big because it's a football stadium. Yeah. It was – there was it, – it just – it was cavernous, and it didn't, that wasn't it didn't the really have any – well, no, but I'm saying you couldn't, if you were in a regular gym, you could maybe get some energy for some of this stuff. There, It just wasn't, there wasn't a good feel for it. Although they were booing Jalen Brown the entire time because the Pacer fans that were there obviously don't like the Celtics. That was the only thing that was audible, I felt like, in regards to energy. Yes. Was Jalen Brown getting booed every single time. Yes. Oh, there he was, was getting energy. killed with boos. There was an energy. It was electronic energy of the <laughs> green floor making everybody look like they were about to vomit. Or, or, or in like Larry Market in space, become the Incredible Hulk, uh, right. which is what we a couple of people joked about. Right. But, but like, so all that's going on, and then like there was real juice for the Stefan Sabrina thing. You could it feel was. real energy in the building. I was out there watching it. It was, it was people were into it. And then Sabrina steps up there and hits fourteen on the first two racks. Was thinking she was going to go for like thirty five. Oh up, my god, she didn't miss. Ends up going for 26, which was the highest score, tied for the highest score that anybody had all night. There were like seven 26s throughout the day. And you're thinking, man, like this is a pretty high number uh, for Steph to clear. And then naturally, the greatest shooter of all time goes out there and hits 29 and wins the thing. But it was it was very cool to see that play out. And I thought, you know, the way Sabrina and Steph handled it, I thought was really cool. Um, you know, it it was neat to see. I mean, Sabrina was like, look, you know, this proves anybody can be out here and compete no matter who they are, which I thought was a cool thing, even if the broadcast didn't necessarily reflect that at times, which people certainly had a lot of comments about. Um, but yeah, it was it was really neat to be there for it. I thought it lived up to it and you know, it was, uh, it'll be interesting to see what it looks like when Caitlin Clark is in this thing next year after she plays. Oh my for God. <laughs> the fever. Amazing. I, uh, I agree. So what I'll do is I will give you a fun anecdote from what happened to me during the three point competition. 
So I'm to Bontemps's point, I'm on the sideline on ESPN radio. So they throw to me live for my pick. And I'm in like the middle of all these guys, right? Like I'm literally in the middle. They're surrounding me. <laughs> and they can hear what I'm saying. So I said, oh, you guys want me to make a pick? All right. And they all turn to me and I said, guys, they want me to make a pick. Who should I pick here? And then Donovan Mitchell, I go, Donovan, you? He turns to me first. I go, Donovan, should I pick you? He's like, hell yeah, you should pick me. So I said, all right, guys, since Donovan Mitchell was the first one to turn to say I should I should pick him, I'm going to go with Donovan Mitchell. And I'm not joking. Damian Lillard turns his head to me like this and goes, and gives me like the side eye. And I go, oh, wait a second. I think Dame's mad that I didn't pick him to go back to back. And he goes, no, no, I'm not mad. I'm not mad. You're good. I'm not mad. And By the then, way, Dame is shooting 25% on catch and shoot threes since January 1st. Right. It's not a bad decision, George, is what I'm saying. Oh, by the way, by the way, I the Dame's last rack when he he, he had to make them. he had to right. make one yeah. money ball to win. Right. And I was sitting there with Sean Lettos from New York and we we're watching it. And he starts missing. I said, Oh man, he's not gonna miss all five of these. <laughs> he he literally had to make the last one. To win. to win, I was like, "Oh yeah. my god!" If he, if he chokes this away, that's not a bit unbelievable. So, so get so this is the best part. So he he wins the thing. He talks to Ali LaForce first. That's how it worked. Basically, they would go to Ali LaForce first on TV, and then they come to me right after. He comes right up to me, walks right up to me, goes, "I bleeping told you, you should have picked me." <laughs> and and I said so. And he he and I. Thankfully, the mic wasn't hot when he said that. Um, and then so I said, you got to tell me the PG version of this on the air. So we did the whole interaction on the air. Then Giannis came in. Uh, he said that Giannis needs to do the dunk contest, which I asked Giannis. Giannis said, no, I'm too old. And then we went back and forth. So it was Honestly, like, a really he's not thing. too old. He's too yeah. tall. Right. There's that. <clears throat> you yeah. can't. It's, it's, <clears throat> I saw uh, Victor Wembanyama says he wants to win all the contests. He wants to win skills, three point. Dunk, yeah. That's all great. A man that big will never win the dunk contest because yeah. you well, can't. He's also not winning the skills because I hope he never does it again. And Anthony Edwards shot left-handed in the, the beginning of it. Well, Anthony Edwards like tanked that thing. Like what's going on there? That like, would not. Wow. Well, by the way, it was four rounds long. I kind of get it. I would I appreciate it. Yeah, he shot. By the he, way. When he came to shooting, he shot left-handed and hit the side of the backboard. It was. This was the real magic moment from Saturday night. Anthony Edwards at practice Saturday. Earlier in the week, he talked about beating Mike Conley, shooting left-handed uh, in a three-point contest. Mike Conley, who is left-handed, and announced that at some point, he's going to do this in a game when they're up 20 in the fourth quarter. He's going to shoot a three left-handed. He said, well, if Chris Finch is going to take me out anyway, might as well give him a reason to take me out of the game. <laughs> so then he comes here Saturday morning. He's at practice. He announces he's going to shoot every shot in the All-Star game left-handed. Then he comes out in the middle of the competition uh, Saturday night and shoots two in a row off the side of the backboard, left-handed from the corner. Comes in afterwards, like, oh, yeah, I was getting it out. It'll look better tomorrow in the oh, game. Oh, no, he's going to still do it. Then then this was the real magic moment. Somebody said, hey, Ant, what did you think of the court? What do you mean? What about the court? Ant, the entire court was lit up. It was an LED court. I don't know, man. I, I didn't. I didn't notice. It was dope. I guess. <laughs> like, like what? And by the way, to your point, the the reason that's the magic more moment was because the NBA wanted the star that night to be the floor. Trust me when I tell you that. Oh yes, yes they did. Well, Sabrina and Steph overcame that, and uh, <laughs> they were the star. And I agree. Uh, there were several hints, both from Sabrina and Steph, that this was hopefully the first of a series. Oh, no, no, these types it's of not a hint. It's it's going to happen. I asked them on the air, are we doing a rematch next year? And they both absolutely said, we'll do it. Because I asked her, I said, you're going to go back and do it. And she's like, I go, the you know, the game's in his house, the house he built. And she's like, well, I'm from the Bay, too. And I said, no, I know. And she said, so, yes, we're going to do it again next year. So they did, there is a rematch on the record, at least according to both of them. And get Caitlin Clark. And if Ant wants to be further embarrassed, he can shoot against Caitlin Clark left handed. And he can, <laughs> by the way, I'll bet Caitlin Clark could go out there left handed and start swishing them. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and Chris Finch might be relieved that Ant is going to potentially get embarrassed shooting left handed. So he won't actually try them 
Uh, well, he did say he would do only do it up 20, to be fair. Well, he didn't say he would do it in the run well, of the game, but okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure know, Chris, we love won't... Ant, but uh, you know, <laughs> oh, listen, I so, listen, it, it was insane. It, so, it was last insane. anecdote for me uh, from that night, I asked both Dame and Mac McClung on the air if they would go for a three peat, uh, not both non committal. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, although I think I told both of them we've never had a, a three time, a three peat champion. Uh, in any of those um, particular contests. So for what it's worth, if you keep track of that stuff, uh, non-committal, although both more intrigued once I said that. By the way, Matt, Matt McClung is averaging 24 points a game in the G League. He's not, he's a real player. He can do more than dunk the basketball. And I kind of feel like he felt a little bit sheepish because he didn't think that he had been as good as he was last year and he won. And so I wonder if that had anything to do with it. All right. So also very quietly in the last couple of uh, days and the end of the before the All-Star break, the Miami Heat had two very good wins, winning in um, Milwaukee without Jimmy Butler and then going around on the second night of a back to back. And granted, Philly didn't have Joel Embiid, but winning in Philly. um you know, you know, in a tough Joel situation. Embiid or a bunch of other players, to be fair. Fair enough. But they were playing the second night of a back to back without Jimmy Butler and they won. And so after going through what was it, George, a seven game losing streak? Um, mm -hmm. They've longest been, in the uh, Eric Spolstra era. Oh, yeah. Spo got that gigantic new contract and then immediately like lost every game for, for two and a half weeks. Um, so the Heat have won six of their last eight games. Um, they've crawled to a decent position in the Eastern standings. Um, they're out of the top six, but considering that they haven't had, I think Tyler heroes missed 20 games and Jimmy Butler's missed 18. Um, Bam Adebayo has, uh, has, you know, missed some time with the hip injury. Um, and by the way, uh, Adebayo who's starting in the all-star game on Sunday, he has 22 games this season with, with at least 20 points and 10 rebounds, um, which is the most in his career. Um, just to and, set it up, the Heat and Magic are tied for seventh, half game behind the Pacers in sixth. Yeah, right. He the tiebreaker on the Magic because they've beaten them three out of four already. I think. By the way, quick trivia question: Who was the last player to have more twenty ten games for the Miami Heat, George? It happened within the last decade. Uh, Hassan okay. Whiteside. Very good. McMahon was, would was never have gotten that. McMahon never would have gotten that. <laughs> um, Duncan Robinson has been hot shooting the three. He's obviously up and down, but he's been hot shooting the three and, um, and, and going at it with Jalen Brown. Let's not forget that he's got Duncan. Yes. With these days. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, well, I, first off, I thought Jalen was a little out of line there and I liked that Duncan like stood up for himself. Um, so, uh, anyway, um, the heat of, uh, of, look, I guess the question is this, this is a team that was the number one seed two years ago made the conference finals, uh, lost to Boston. Um, last year, obviously got into the play-in was the, um, did they, did they get the eighth seed or the seventh seed? I can't remember. They're the eighth seed. seed. They eighth almost seed. lost to Chicago. That's in right. The, the eighth, eighth place play. -in. That's right. They lost the first play-in. Yes. And we're down to Chicago. Um, George, is this, is this team a threat like the last two years or what, what do we have here? I mean, I think based on, the last four years, right? Like you can't count them out. So I guess the answer to that is yes, with an asterisk, right? Maybe. Um, I think that it's, I think it's matchup dependent for them, particularly in the first round. Like you don't want to be the eight seed having to play Boston again like that. There's not going to be that kind of magic this time around. If you're going to end up facing Boston, you want to face them in the end, like you've faced them in three out of the last four seasons to give yourself the best chance potentially um to beat them but i think for them there's a lot of teams besides boston that they feel they would probably feel confident against clearly milwaukee is one of them like in that game um spolster has been kind of throwing guys in and out of the lineup particularly at the power forward position he started nikola jovic their young player who they drafted two years ago huh. he had an incredible game in that game yeah right um they did the same thing against Philly. He was he was bad, and they, he yanked him, basically, and played very few minutes in that game. So maybe that's kind of their move is they'll see if he's good in a particular game, and they'll go with it. But 
I think their thing is we haven't seen our team whole is the way they have described it to me because of the reasons you've alluded to. And let's not forget Terry Rozier is also hurt now. Yeah. So that, that's like to say he's not, yeah. they're not going to see their team whole because Terry Rozier sprained his knee last week. Now it could have been worse, um, but uh, you know, they don't have a timetable on it, but a sprained knee is it's a weeks long injury. You know, yeah. it's, uh, Several I don't, yeah, yeah, don't want to, I don't want to speculate, but it's, he won't be back in the short term here. So, right. Right. Uh, but they, certainly they, not as bad as it looked like, which looked, right. initially looked very looked bad. Awful. Yeah. It looked awful, but I think they expect him back before the playoffs is what I gathered. Um, but yeah, I don't know how soon before the playoffs is the question, but yeah, look, I think they look at the rest of the East outside of Boston and they say to themselves, yeah, we'll take our chances in one of those matchups. Now I think it's in their best interest to not be in the play in this year and be one of those top six teams. But I don't think that Philly scares them by any stretch of the imagination. I don't think Cleveland scares them. Well, Milwaukee doesn't scare them, clearly. Not at all. Right. So <laughs> well, I What's the they, opposite of scared? Because that's what they are against Milwaukee. Yeah, yeah they're completely confident against, uh, against Milwaukee, I think. But, yeah, so I think that as long as they avoid the eighth seed, they're, you know, they've got a fighter's chance, a puncher's chance, basically, to be where they've been in previous years or at least three of the last four. Yeah. I think that's the way to look at it is, you know, the Celtics went and got Chris Esporzingis in large part. And we've talked about this before on the pod because of the way Bam Adebayo has messed with this team in the past. And Bam has always been able to sort of rove around and guard whoever he wanted because there wasn't anybody he had to stick to. Right. And if you've watched these games against the heat so far this season, he's had to stay on Porzingis. He can't go on to somebody else. And that's completely changed the geometry of how the Heat have tried to stop them. And the Celtics have looked much better against them. Although they just, they did just play a couple days ago and the the Celtics won by four as uh, George mentioned. They had a, yeah, they had a late, Jimmy didn't play in that game and the Celtics, you know, in, as they, their want to do sometimes saw the fourth quarter get a little tighter after they controlled a lot of the game. But it, it, I, I think looking at that matchup, the the addition of Porzingis, if he's healthy, I think totally changes the 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 calculus from what it was before. But you look at the rest of these teams, like George said, the Heat are not going to be afraid of playing any of these other teams in the East. They're going to think they can go toe to toe with anybody and beat them in advance. They've got Eric Spolstra, who's you know the best coach in the league, in my opinion. They've got Jimmy, who has shown up time and again in the playoffs, and if he's there and ready to go at the start of the playoffs. He's as good as anybody you're going to play in a series, in a seven-game series. And, you know, the the real question to me is, you know, we'll see what happens when we get Terry Rozier back on the court. That was an interesting move to me on a lot of fronts. It was not the kind of move we typically see the Heat make, especially after they've sort of waited to get stars a bunch of times, right? And they go make this move for Terry Rozier. They ship out Kyle Lowry. And... I'm curious to see what that portends for the summer if this team does not make a run because it doesn't feel to me like Terry Rogier and Tyler Hero is a long-term partnership to me. And I sort of wonder if this Terry Rogier deal, who's on a smaller deal by a decent amount than Tyler going forward, isn't sort of a precursor where if this doesn't go great this summer, perhaps Tyler Hero ends up somewhere else in a move for the Heat to balance out their books a little bit because we know Miami is not going to go way into the tax and they're going to have some questions yeah. to answer going forward. Well, they forward are in the tax this year and yeah. typically they try to avoid the tax if they can. They they made a big move and didn't avoid the tax, although they did save money on that deal. They did. And then they then they spent some more money because right before the break, they uh, picked up uh, DeLon Wright in a buyout situation. Um, I'm not sure if that was in motion before Terry Rogier went down or not, but uh, certainly a sign that she's going to be out for a bit though. Cause right. you think the line, right. Would have gone somewhere where he was going to play. And right. I would certainly, and with Josh Richardson also out, I believe he has a separated shoulder. Um, I think he also, that was also, I think in that Celtics game. Yes. They um, had both those injuries happen. Yeah. Uh, so he'll, he'll have a pretty big role there. And that was a good pickup for them. I think. Yeah, and by the way, they they they've been interested in Delon Wright in the past. Um, you know, they go way back with the family because Darrell, his older brother, yep. played for the Heat during uh, the Shaq and Wade era. Um, and look, this team, to your point, Tim and Brian, you know, it, it will be year five basically of this group. 
um, which is longer than most Riley teams get kept together. Uh, now, granted, you know, we talked about the Warriors in two different timelines. The Heat also kind of act on two different timelines because Jimmy is much more advanced in his age and in his at this point in his career than the other guys. Like Bam is like the next oldest guy of their core guys. Um, the rest of those guys are younger than, you know, 25, 26 years old. So mm -hmm. they are kind of operating a little bit on two timelines as well. But if you look at the Riley teams historically, whether it was those Zoe Timmy teams with Mashburn, um, those were like four years. Uh, then the next iteration um, didn't even last that because of Zoe's kidney uh, issues. But it was supposed to be Eddie Jones, Brian Grant, Zoe, uh, and an aging Tim Hardaway. Then you had Shaq and Wade. That group lasted four years. LeBron's group lasted four years. So this group has lasted longer than the previous iterations of Heat teams that were supposed to contend. Well, and by the way, to go back again to what we talked about with the Warriors earlier, the Heat currently have seven players under contract for next season. And they're, according to Bobby's numbers, $9 million into the tax with seven players. So if they don't make a move, even if they just sign minimum players, they're going to be in the neighborhood of $20 million into the tax, which is more than they typically are. And that's, they're, they're not going to probably have a team full of minimum players. So that you're looking at a very expensive team. Just well, it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. You may beat the heat, but you ain't out thinking them. So, yeah. Yeah, so I promise you, uh, they, they, they definitely have their options laid out and we'll see which path they take, but certainly um, they're rallying and we'll see how they return after the all-star break. All right, before we go, guys, I think we're contractually obligated to talk about the Lakers who had a, a real <laughs> nice win without LeBron um, against the Utah jazz before the break. Um, this, this is something that's crazy. I mentioned this on first take the other day. If I had told you, George, George does radio in LA and listens to you crazy Laker fans on a daily basis. Um, if I had compared this Laker team to the Showtime Lakers uh, a couple of weeks ago with their offensive prowess, you would have hung up the phone and uh, probably not wanted to continue. You would have put me in the don't call us back list. But over the last 11 games, and I know before you go crazy, Bon Temps, it's not the eras are different. In the last 11 games, which the Lakers rating three, they're averaging 126 points a game which is the most in 11 game stretch since 1987, the heart of Showtime Lakerdom. And um, basically D'Angelo Russell has been scorching hot. He's averaged 26 points a game in the last 15 games. Basically his time as starter, his first starter, his first game as a starter was in the, was in the previous time they played in Utah. And so sort of, this is sort of the stretch in between them, the state, the Lakers were in when they came to Utah in January and when they came back in February, vastly different situations. Um, not only did he has he been shooting the ball great, he had a 17 assist game against the Jazz. Rui Hachimura, who's um, rediscovered his uh, shooting, Bon Temps is always bringing up his shooting uh, sort of being a possible, uh, you know, um, aberration in the playoffs last year. He had 36 uh, points and six threes in that game, and Anthony Davis is having an All NBA season. Um, so George, you know the Lakers. Is this a sustainable stretch, or are they just living and dying with a hot D'Angelo Russell? Um, I, I think it's more sustainable, and because you look at it, I look at it this way. So in six of their last seven games, which they've won uh, six of those, um, Rui Hachimura has played basically thirty minutes a night outside of one game, and I didn't understand the entire season. Uh, why they weren't playing bigger, because that is kind of to their strength. That's kind of their one thing that I think uh, helps them the most. And it's kind of the lineup they were playing in the playoffs most of the time last year. But uh, I remember tweeting this, and it might be the tweet in the last year that I've had that had the most engagement because Laker fans went bonkers ripping Darvin Ham. Um, but Darvin was very loyal to Torian Prince. Um, you know, Darvin, and even in these meetings that we have that of stuff that we can talk about on the record um, before games, I've had them a bunch this year. He was always talking about Torian and his spacing and his ability to space. And that helps the team. Um, and yes, it does. But I feel like he's more of a liability defensively. 
And I just didn't think that it, it worked the way he envisioned it. I think in, in practicality, um, or in theory, rather, it, it worked better than in practicality. So I know Darwin had a history with Torian because he had him in, in, in Atlanta when he was an assistant. So they go way back. But I felt like he was way too loyal to him, especially considering Rui had really helped them during the playoffs. So he made the switch finally to Rui playing more minutes and Torian playing less minutes, uh, conversely. So it, it was one of those things that I feel like that has helped them. Um, so I think it's more sustainable. I don't think that they're a championship team at the moment, if that's your question. I think that much like a lot of teams, you know, we were just talking about Miami a little while ago, also kind of matchup dependent in, in the playoffs. I don't think that they can do the play-in thing and come out and, and have to play Let's say, God forbid, they have to play Denver in the first round. They're done if they have to play Denver in the first round, in my opinion. Now, yes, they are. But if they have to play OKC, I, I like their chances against Oklahoma City. Um, as great as Oklahoma City has been this year, because you're talking about a team that never really been in a playoff series before versus LeBron James and Anthony Davis and a group that had been uh, in the Western Conference Finals last year. Even Minnesota, like, I like their chances. So I, I think, I don't like them against the Clippers necessarily, even though they've had regular season success against them. But if they can face Minnesota or OKC in that first round, I do think they can have a deep playoff. All right, Bontemps, it's on the tee. No, I mean, George George had very good analysis. We don't have, it wasn't Bozo analysis like we do sometimes on the other spot on the pod. Um <laughs> No, look, I, we've talked about this a lot. The Lakers, the Lakers, and I, I, you know, I don't know if I necessarily would say that having Rui out there allows them to lean into their size, but either way, they they need to and have needed to play into their size because that is, George, the path for them to be successful. And if you go back to last year's playoffs, people look at it like a criticism when you say they played a Memphis team that was down a bunch of bigs and then yeah. they played a Warriors team that is small. Incredible. In reality, matchup, that's no right. Question. Yes. Right. They, they, they got favorable matchups and they really took advantage of them and pounded teams in size and used their physicality in size. And Anthony Davis coming into play in center, he is a massive human being and he plays big and he's all over the glass and at the rim, he's playing really well defensively and they're able to get to the line a lot, be physical and be a team that can overwhelm teams in that respect. And yeah, like, look, they're not as good as the Oklahoma City Thunder. But if they do play the Thunder in a seven-game series, it could very well be like those series last year, where you basically got Chet Holmgren and a bunch of wings, and it's going to be a challenge for the Thunder to keep up with them in that respect. Whereas if they do play Denver in the first round, or frankly, I think if they play Minnesota, in the first round with their size, I think they're going to have more trouble because that is the way the Warriors, the, the Lakers have to win. Like I know you referenced Showtime there, Brian, but like they have to play more like the bad boy Pistons in the eighties than the Lakers. And they have to physically intimidate and get into teams and have like the fear factor of LeBron and the fear factor of AD and go to the line and sort of mash their way through. And if they do get the right matchups, then yeah, I think they do have a chance to win a series or or make a little bit of a run if their guys are healthy. But I think they are incredibly matchup dependent. And by the way, we're looking at a scenario right now where I think it's fairly likely that the 9-10 game in the e in the West is Lakers Warriors because they're three games back in the loss column of Dallas and Sacramento. And you say, "Well, it's three games, like that's not that much." Well, it's a lot when you're talking about 25, 26 games, which is where we're at in the schedule. So, you know, I, I'm very curious to see how this all shakes out. But if we're looking at a 9-10 Lakers-Warriors game in six weeks, eight weeks, it's going to be a lot of excited TV executives for one night <laughs> and then a lot of sad ones after right. that. Well, I would just say I, I'm the matchup you guys are – talking about for the Lakers to make sort of run the matchups have to work out and they do have a size advantage Oklahoma City the Clippers occasionally struggle with size I think ultimately they will be able to solve it because they have an excellent coach and a very deep roster that can do a lot of different things but 
size has given the Clippers a little bit of issue. And of course, size has given the Warriors an issue. So if you can, if you can plot a way where they could, I mean, if you're looking at the sunny disposition, how are the Lakers getting back to the conference finals? Give me the, the chance. Well, if you get Warriors in the play in and you get Oklahoma City in the first round and you get the Clippers in the second round and you avoid Minnesota and Denver, which right now Minnesota and Denver are one four, like it's not an impossible concept. I could give you my whiteboard analysis about how they could pull it off. They'd have to play great, but you know, there is reason to lean into the size. And the other thing is Jared Vanderbilt, who's he had this foot injury and his prognosis isn't even clear yet. The Lakers are being mum on that. But um to be honest, I don't I I didn't think the Jared Vanderbilt injury was nearly as big a deal as most people made it out to be. Because well, you say that, but it clarified it limited Darwin's options because Darwin had been starting Vanderbilt too. Well, what I was going to say was everyone seems to just have amnesia about the fact that when it got down to it in the playoffs, he was not being played because he's such a non factor. I understand that. I understand he so that. Big, that's he helped them against the, in the Warriors series because he hounded Steph. He does a great job hounding Steph and yeah, making that's true. He, that's was, true. he was starting him at times over Hachimura. And so that's why it's relevant. Um, but, you know, we'll be keeping a very close eye on those Lakers. All right. Thank you for watching the Hoop Collective presented by State Farm. Thank you to State Farm. Thank you to George and Tim Bontemps for spending some of their all-star weekend with us. Thank you to Jackson and Andrea, our producers. And thank you for watching and listening. We'll talk to you soon.